Hello, welcome back to a Better Brain Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Patrick Porter. Today I have a very special guest, someone I can call a friend. We've been working together for a number of years. We, we started out looking at um, heart rate variability as one of the things that we kind of got together on at first. And we met at a conference and then he came back with his own tools and techniques. He's a researcher. He never takes no for an answer and he goes out and researches and finds out what works. He's also the author of a book that I think everyone on this summit needs to read. It's called Saving Your Brain. And that's what he's gonna be talking a little bit about today. Who I'm talking about is Dr. Kelly Miller. So uh, Dr. Miller, welcome to the summit. I'm gonna let you take it away. You have a little presentation for it. You know, today um, we are absolutely in a brain dysfunction epidemic and uh, we're going to talk a, a, a lot about the aging brain but we've got uh, ADHD uh, over one in ten of the population you know boys more than girls but it's the number one reason for uh, children to be medicated and there's been over a two thousand percent increase in the use of medication and the medication hasn't changed for 50 years so it's they're really on an outdated model that this is a chemical imbalance and we know that it's not a there's much more than that there's a actually problems with the uh, different systems in the brain autism spectrum last stats i saw were one in 38 you know 20 years ago we we're talking about one in 10,000. 50 million americans are medicated for anxiousness since covid in insomnia we have 60 million americans have sleeping disorder so these are these are all indications of brain dysfunction alzheimer's now the fifth leading cause of death and you know one in ten over the age of 70 are going to have this so really big problems when we're talking about the aging brain uh, a person has probably had alzheimer's for about 15 years before their diagnosis and there's seven stages of alzheimer's and most people don't get diagnosed till stage three or four we're just going to go over that obviously stage one there's no memory problems but there's already some neurodegenerative changes beginning uh, stage two forgetting familiar words location of eyeglasses or everyday objects you know that's when you're always misplacing your phone misplacing things uh, i think a lot of us are uh, there stage three mild cognitive impairment uh, this is usually when your friends and family co-workers start noticing some little differences uh, problems with words and names misusing those and uh, decreased ability to remember names after introductions and this will start uh, you know this individual will start to have performance issues in social settings in the workplace uh, with friends and family and co-workers and there's a marked decrease in retaining information after reading it Again, losing or misplacing valuable objects. So uh, that could be more uh, besides your phone and your eyeglasses. And then there's a uh, decrease in the ability to plan and organize. A lot of patients here with stage four when uh, they get an official diagnosis and have difficulty with simple arithmetic and have poor short-term short, short memory. So they can't remember what they had for breakfast or lunch or what they ate yesterday. And again, they're having more and more problems and ability to manage their finance or pay bills and may start to forget details of their life histories. In stage five, this is where as healthcare providers, we should absolutely recognize by this stage. And that's when you're just interviewing someone. So it's, it's important, I think, when you know with different people and we're dealing with them that we need to talk about them, have the pe person talk about themselves and do some recollection. Oh, where'd you go to high, where'd you go to high school? You know, where you came to college? And, and uh, it's scary sometimes uh, what they can't recall. Again, they can be confused about the date and the day of the week or the season, you know, dressing inappropriately uh, for the season or the occasion. And then, you know, we just do different things. Like lots of times we'll have the patients subtract two from a hundred or, you know, uh, by fours. And again, uh, they usually retain most of the information about themselves and know their own name and the names of their spouse and children here. And they usually don't have any problem as far as uh, bathing themselves or, or getting meals and things like this. It's stage six. This is definitely someone who's going to have to have a caretaker and they're going to have to help feed them, go to the bathroom and different things like this. They're going to start losing a lot of speech and uh, very little speech or uh, just in fragments and um, dealt with patients in this. Uh, we actually had one patient that was in this stage who had been nonverbal for several months and, and uh, started speaking again and was not able to control their bladder and was able to go to the bathroom on their own. 
own and things like that. So um, you don't want to wait till it gets someone's that bad, but you, you can turn it around. But they're going to need an awful lot of support from family. So at stage seven, uh, basically this person is very vegetative. They have their posture is really bad. They're going to be stooped over. They have, they've lost movement. They're going to have trouble swallowing. And this is something, you know, in the aging patient, we need to think about when people are starting to have problems with swallowing, that they're probably in cognitive decline. And, and one of the things also uh, I want to point out with people, when we look at postural things, you know, coming from a chiropractic background, you know, we always were looking at posture, people's forward head posture, leaning at the waist and things like that. And, uh, you know, always thought those were biomechanical, but we know now that that's actually a sign of the frontal cortex weakening. And one of the things, um, it's an ipsilateral system to the frontal cortex called the PM, uh, pons meticular reticulating uh, formation. But basically it activates your extensor muscles. If the frontal cortex isn't active, you can't get these extensor muscles. And so you're in, you're going into flex. So that's something that we should be more aware of that that's a sign and also uh, a lack of arm swinging is a problem. So, you know, one of the issues with Alzheimer's, with all the resources out there, all the pharmacological billions and billions, hundreds of billions of uh, dollars in research, you know, there's been 350 studies and they haven't come up with anything really. Uh, the best case scenario, you may get some may, some minor improvement for a few uh, weeks, months. And the reason is because drugs only work on a single pathway. And when we look at Alzheimer's, there are multiple causes that can create this beta amyloid form formation and the plaquing. And we're going to co uh, cover that. So in my book, Saving Your Brain, each letter is an acronym. We're going to kind of briefly go over that. And, um, you know, about two months before I published my book, Dale Bredson published his book, The End of Alzheimer. And for you guys, that's another great book you need to read. And, uh, he was a medical researcher, pharmacological researcher, and he came to the conclusion, not, we're not going to find a drug for this. And uh, in his book, he has the big three, which I'll cover from mine uh, as well. But there you have it. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I know we could we could talk for hours. We have when we're at events <laughs> in, in your, your latest research. You're always out there cutting edge, finding what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm.